In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's the end of the age, and the sheep and goats have been separated. All the saints have entered through the gates of heaven. Gabriel blows his trumpet, announcing that the great celebration is about to begin, and everyone is ready. Well, everyone but one. Jesus remains standing outside the gate with his eyes firmly fixed on the horizon. Peter is getting ready to lock the gates and anxious to join the celebration, and as he looks off, the crowd is almost out of sight. So he walks over to Jesus and asks, Master, for what are you waiting? Jesus, not taking his eyes off the horizon, says, I'm waiting for Judas. You see, Jesus knew that Judas belonged. Sure, he'd erred and strayed like a lost sheep, but as much as the generations of popes and priests and deacons, well, maybe not interim priests, <laughs> and senior wardens and junior wardens and vestry members and altar guilders and ushers and lay readers and acolytes and thrift shop workers, and community gardens and towel ministers and Monday morning maintenance volunteers and Eucharistic visitors and prayer shawl knitters and coffee conversationalists and Sunday school teachers and even septuagenarian kamikaze wannabes who climb 20-foot ladders to hang Christmas garlands from the ceiling <laughs> and of course office administrators as much as any of these Judas belonged. Jesus assured his disciples, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, room for everyone, everyone, room for all. And there's room for everyone here, because if you walk through that door, you belong. You belong here. But here's the thing. You don't own belonging. Belonging is an act of grace. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You simply have it. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, where unless you were a fifth or sixth generation family, you really didn't belong. Maybe that's why I left. <laughs> I felt like I didn't belong. And then I followed my wife, Laura, to Miami, Florida, where much of the time, whether or not you belong simply depends on how much you have in your bank account. But in this place, you belong simply because you're here, because you are. Whoever you are, however you are, you belong. In this morning's reading from Job, God has tested Job. He makes a little side bet with Satan. God has boasted to Satan about Job. He said, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth a blameless and upright man. Well, Satan sort of chuckles and says, and why not? You build a fence around him and his house and all that he has, and he had much. He had 10 upright children, we're told, 10 upright children. And any of you all, like me, who have raised children, know it's hard enough to have one upright children, child, much less 10. Job had big herds of oxen and donkeys and sheep and camels and had the servants to keep them. And he had the position in society that all those possessions would imply. And Satan took it all, leaving Job entirely and utterly alone, without belongings and belonging to no one, simply alone. In Psalm 22, we read this morning, the psalmist is just as alone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. I'm a worm and no man, 
scorned by all and despised by the people. In short, I'm all alone, and I don't belong to anyone or with anyone, anywhere. I'm just alone. I don't belong. Then there's that rich young man from this morning's reading from Mark. What must I do, he asked Jesus, to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not, shall not bear false witness, you shall not, shall not defraud, you shall honor your father and your mother. Well, I can see this young kid right now wiping his brow and saying, Whew, I've done all that since my youth. But Jesus interjects a little oops. They're not so fast. There's just one more little thing. Sell all that you own and give the money to the poor. And then come follow me. Be with me. Be with us. Belong with us. And the young man went away grieving because Mark tells us he had many possessions. He made a very difficult choice. Rather than belonging to Jesus, he chose to belong to his own belongings. And my friends, there is no more alone than that. Not belonging and being alone is what's been so hard about the last 18 months. The separation, going to Zoom instead of coming to church, bumping elbows and fists instead of shaking hands, staring longingly across the aisle and waving the peace instead of sharing a kiss. And couple that with what's going on in this country. This is the point at which I start repeating coffee and conversation for those of you that were there, so just bear with me. <laughs> this nation is about as divided as it's ever been. In recent years, at an ever-increasing rate, we are becoming all about separations. You've probably read that on the west coast of the United States, in big cities, there are large groups of people who are getting together pulling up roots and moving to small towns in the Northwest, even creating new small towns in the Northwest, homogenous small towns, where everyone thinks alike, everyone feels alike, everyone hates and loves the same, Republicans against Democrats, Christians against Jews, against Muslims, Americans against Mexicans, white against black, against yellow. Simply us against the other. This is not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Airlines are having problems with pugnacious passengers, more problems with pugnacious passengers than they have with on-time arrivals. Fine restaurants are having to hire security personnel, sometimes even National Guardsmen just to protect their customers from one another. Our children are arriving at schools with more angry, shouting adults and security personnel, including National Guardsmen, than the integration of the Jim Crow South in the 50s and 60s. This is decidedly not the peace that passes all understanding. Stop for a moment and remember why God came to earth as Jesus Christ in the first place. At the beginning of the first century, God surveyed his chosen people, his creation, and found that they were badly divided. The community of people he had chosen was in a shambles. There were Jews and Gentiles, Jews against Gentiles, and remember that a Gentile is anyone who's not a Jew. There were the clean and the unclean, the in-crowd and the outcasts, and even the in-crowd was badly divided. The Pharisees and the Essenes and, Essenes and the Sadducees couldn't agree on anything. The leaders of the Jewish community were more concerned about their own social and economic welfare than they were about the people they led. They were more concerned about themselves than the people they led. Imagine that. 
So God sent his son to restore creation to community. Now, think back a couple of weeks ago to the reading, the Old Testament reading from the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers. Moses is leading the Israelites through the desert, and the people are exhausted by scarcity. They're haunted by memories of fresh food, and they're circulating fake news visions of fabricated abundance back in Egypt. The people are absolutely at the breaking point. And so was Moses. Moses said to God, I'm not able to carry these people alone. They're too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, just let me die. One commentator offers this summary of Numbers. Says, when faced with the wilderness and dangers of entering the promised land, the center no longer holds. Obedience to God's command turns to rebellion. Trust becomes mistrust. The holy is profane. Order becomes disorder. And the future of the people of God is threatened. So what did God do? He said to Moses, go and select 70 of the elders of Israel. Bring them to the tent of the meeting and have them take their place with you. I will take some of the spirit off of you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not have to bear it all by yourself. In other words, Moses, you won't be alone. You'll belong. All four Gospels tell us that about a thousand years later, the first thing Jesus did in his new ministry was to call 12 disciples. Now, they weren't the smartest. They weren't the most clever, they weren't the most accomplished, and they certainly weren't the most honorable. But they were the makings of a community. At least until that day on Calvary, when Jesus was all alone. These stories take place over a period of 3,000 years, but they're still a story for our time. A time when our center doesn't feel like it's holding when the world threatens to crumble under the weight of a pandemic, climate change, polarizing politics, misinformation, overconsumption, and violence. My first Sunday as interim rector at St. Thomas was on May 22nd, 2016, and my last Sunday was the Sunday after Thanksgiving, November 26, 2017. And during those 18 months, I preached again and again and again about the importance of community, about my absolute conviction that community is what Christianity is all about, that community defines Christianity, and that without one another, we can talk about our faith until we're blue in the face and we're just a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. Think about it. If God called 70 elders of Israel to create a community around Moses and 12 disciples to create a community around Jesus, he must be absolutely howling at us to stop with all the leave me alone, get away from me, and to try instead, welcome. Welcome to my circle of friends, welcome to my church, Welcome to my country, or even just welcome to my space. Welcome to be in community with me. So what are we to do? What can we do? Think Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Won't you be my neighbor? 156 years ago, Robert E. Lee having been offered leadership of major business corporations all over the eastern seaboard, having been encouraged to run for national, local, or regional office, said no to it all. He mounted Traveler, his trusty war horse, and rode across the Blue Ridge Mountains into the Shenandoah Valley and accepted the presidency of a tiny little men's school, then called Washington College. Lee was convinced that the only way the South could be rebuilt, was to educate its young men. And, he was convinced, 
that they had to build community between the North and the South. And Lee's view of community was one of the essential practices of his view of community was when you passed a stranger or somebody you knew anywhere, you looked them in the eye and you said something or just a nod of a hello, but you, you greeted them in some way. And after his death, this practice survived. It became known as the speaking tradition. When I first got to what was then Washington Lee University in 1964, I was shocked that everybody I passed on that campus, half the people in town, students, faculty members, administrators, sometimes even just visitors, everyone would look me in the eye, maybe a word of greeting, hello, how are you, or maybe just a nod or some other gesture, but everyone would acknowledge my presence. And whatever the form of their greeting, I knew that I belonged, that I was welcome there, that I was recognized and valued. As spectacularly beautiful as the campus at Washington Lee is, and it is one of the prettiest campuses in the United States, almost every visitor that comes remembers one thing. They remember what a friendly place it was. How as they walked across that campus, they weren't strangers. They really felt like they belonged. When I arrived in Miami to practice law after seven years of living in that wonderful community, I found that it was such a habit that I just kept doing it. And when you greet somebody like that in downtown Miami, But I couldn't break the habit, and one of the reasons is because it warmed my heart as much as it warmed the people I greeted. We can all throw up our hands in frustration and just give up in the face of all this anti-community force that surrounds us. We can decide it's not my job to fix it. It's somebody else's problem. But my friends, it's not. It's our problem. Community is the essence of what we were chosen to be, of what we were chosen to build, and we can at least try, at least try, as Christians to do what we were chosen to do. We can at least try to, one, to love one another as Christ loved us. So I invite you, I encourage you, start your own speaking tradition. When you get up tomorrow morning, when you leave here today, and you encounter people, friends or strangers, look them in the eye. Acknowledge their presence. Just say a brief word of greeting, or again, just, just some gesture. Let them know that they are not alone, and that they do belong. It's such a simple thing. It's so easy, and it will warm your heart as much as it warms theirs. It's a small step for you, but it could be a giant leap for humankind. Try it. You'll like it. Amen. <laughs>